Hello and welcome to the Yale SOM Exchange webinar, Making Finance Work for Women. Yale SOM Exchange is SOM series of online conversations. The series is meant to provide alumni and the broader SOM community with opportunities to keep learning about faculty research, alumni activities, and career strategies. I'm Tony Sheldon, uh, SOM class of 84, and I'm the executive director of the Program on Social Enterprise and a lecturer in the practice of management at SOM. It gives me particular pleasure to be able to welcome today Mary Ellen Iskandarian, SOM class of 1986, uh, and the president and CEO of Women's World Banking. My first foray into international development started with a six week project for Women's World Banking in 1990, which turned into 10 years of working very closely with them. <laughs> and then the past 20 plus years fully engaged in the field. So it's great to be able to connect that circle. Since 2006, Mary Ellen has been president and CEO of Women's World Banking, which is a global nonprofit committed to giving low income women in the developing world access to financial tools and resources to achieve security and prosperity. You'll be hearing a lot more about that. Prior to Women's World Banking, Mary Ellen worked for 17 years at the International Finance Corporation, which is the private sector wing of the World Bank. Before that, she was an investment banker. Uh, she is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, as well as the Women's Forum of New York and the UN's Business and Sustainable Development Commission. So the occasion that brings us all together is the recent publication of Mary Ellen's book called There's Nothing Micro About a Billion Women, Making Finance Work for Women. So with great pleasure, I introduce you to Mary Ellen Iskandarian. Tony, thank you so much. That was such a generous introduction. It is just a tremendous pleasure to be back in the SOM community and, and reconnecting. But for the reasons you mentioned, uh, really quite a pleasure to, to connect with you and, and start this conversation um, together. Um, we thought we'd talk a little bit about the book, which I'm, I'm excited about sharing um, with this, this audience. And then maybe uh, Tony and I will open things up for a broader conversation about uh, financial inclusion that we hope we'll be able to, to bring you, um, the audience, uh, into the loop with some question and answer. Um, uh, one so thing I forgot I... to mention is just to say, if you have any questions along the way, please yeah. submit them in the Q&A box in the Zoom, at the bottom of the Zoom. And we'll also yeah, definitely make time to respond to as many questions from you all as we can. Sorry to interrupt, Mary Ellen. I no, no, so glad you, you pointed that out because that's really, that's always the best part actually, <laughs> seeing what's on the audience's mind. But um, so yes, this is my my baby that I launched into the world a couple of, couple of weeks ago. Um, it was made very clear to me by my, my publisher, uh, MIT Press, that this book was not about me. They weren't actually particularly interested in hearing about me. Um, they really wanted to hear about the women that I have been so privileged to meet over the course of my career at Women's World Banking and telling their stories, particularly about how having access or frankly, having been denied access to finance had a transformative impact um, on their lives. So it seems to make sense to open the story with one of those women. Um, I'm going to tell you that we see here in outline, I'm going to tell you about um, Hiyama Abu Shakir, who was a client of a, a, an amazing uh, microfinance institution in Jordan, Microfund for Women. And I fully recognize that the one woman's one woman story does not um, allow us really to draw conclusions more broadly about general experience. But I can also tell you that the story um, of Hyam and her family and all of the stories that I tell throughout the book are ones that women around the world have shared with me and my colleagues at Women's World Banking time and time again. 
Um, so back to Hiam, she's actually Lebanese um, and her family sent her to Jordan to earn money and send money back to the family during the, the Lebanese Civil War. And she told me about how lonely she was when she first got to, to Jordan and found it difficult to find, find friends and a home. And so she was particularly proud about being a member of this community with her husband and, and their three sons in a, uh, a neighborhood, for those of you who know um, Amman, the, Mar the Marka neighborhood of, of Amman. And she told me that early on in her marriage, she wanted to earn some money on her own to spend on things that were important to her around the house. And so since her husband Hassan was a butcher, it made sense for her to sell cold cuts and sausages. And she was very good at that and her popularity of her products grew. And so she took out a loan from Microfund for women to buy a meat grinder that within, you know, small matter of time allowed her to double her capacity for sale. But then, you know, disaster really truly struck uh, when Hassan had a heart attack and he had been in the Jordanian military. So he was treated in the military hospital, but Jordan, like many countries throughout the emerging world, um, all of their other medical expenses had to be sort of out of pocket. So nursing care, the, the linens on the bed, um, his special diet for his heart condition, all of that came out of the family's pocket. And if you added to that, the time that Hiam was away from her business, the family's savings were really completely depleted. Um, and then unfortunately a second blow uh, fell just as Hassan was being discharged from the hospital when the doctor said that he could no longer work. And so sort of overnight, um, Hiam's sort of money on the side or pin money had become the family's sole source of income. And so I think that part of Hiam's story seems like a good place for us to stop for a moment and talk about what financial inclusion is, how it's defined, and, and maybe what it's not. Um, so if you change the slide, um, Kara, that would be great. Uh, so today, 1.7 billion people, that's fully a third of the world's adult population, lack a bank or mobile money account in their own name. And that is the formal regulatory technical definition of being financially included. More than half of that 1.7 billion adults, 57% are women. And the gender gap between men and women in the emerging markets is 9%. And if you uh, turn the slide, you can see some of the really tremendous uh, advances that have been made and things that we'll be talking about later in the conversation, like mobile phone ownership and identification. Each of these are critical parts along the journey to inclusion that have been consistently denied women. And so that gender gap has not budged, that 9% gap has not budged in all the years that we've been collecting the data. But I'd argue there's also a gap beyond just the way we define it as is really so insufficient. There's also a gap in, in what should be uh, available to you in order to be fully included. Um, we believe at Women's World Banking that convenient and affordable way to make payments and send money is an absolute essential. People, and this is something we hear, especially from women, want a safe place to save their money. They do want an ability to borrow for large purchases or to take advantages, advantage of opportunities in their personal lives or businesses. It's just that they don't only want the ability to borrow. And then they need products like insurance products to mitigate and manage the risks and protect against losing all that they've built. So I go into a lot of detail in the book about why the traditional microfinance credit only model really was not enough to really build the kinds of, of sustainable livelihoods and, and allow people to be fully included. But I'd argue that it wasn't just about gaining access to these other products, especially as more and more financials and other services were being de delivered by a digital means, but people also need the knowledge and confidence to use those products and to have access to the appropriate technology. 
And then I'd push that financial inclusion definition maybe one step further to say that people deserve to be treated with dignity, not in a predatory way with uh, being charged excessive fees that they may not have been told about, usurious interest rates, predatory collective practices. So all of those consumer protection um, concerns, I believe, and, and Women's World Banking pushes for, uh, need to be included in that understanding of what it truly means to be a full financial citizen in the, the formal financial, uh, financial system. And so why does it matter? You know, why is in the face of so many other issues, um, why does it matter? that uh, financial inclusion takes so much primacy in, in, in this conversation. And again, I'd say it really matters both at the micro and the macro level. At the macro level, uh, financial inclusion can be a driver, not just of growth, but of genuinely inclusive growth. And I point to two pieces of IMF research that I found really enlightening that clearly showed that gender inequality is directly correlated to the um, inequality, overall inequality in an economy. But then also that you can only benefit from inclusive growth when most, those who are most excluded are brought into the economy. And as the, uh, the slides shows, Women in every region, every age group, every demographic category, developed country, developing country are the most included. So we really cannot talk about financial inclusion, inclusive growth, or even addressing economic inequality, inequality without addressing the fact that women are systematically decide, denied access to and control of the levers of economic progress and particularly to the financial tools. So I'd also mentioned that this idea of sort of sidelining half of your adult population, right now as we're sort of reeling from the COVID crisis heading into the post-invasion Ukraine crisis, has had real impact on the global economy. The IMF has made consistent downward growth projections for 2022 and into next year. And right now they're projecting for both this year and next year, 3.6% growth. So I fully recognize that a complex set of factors have contributed to this economic slowdown, but closing that gender gap, that 9% gender gap in financial inclusion could compensate for much of this shortfall and probably more as well. But I, I think the, the micro level impacts are equally interesting and Women's World Banking spends a lot of time looking at the impact on individual women of an interaction with the financial sector. And I, I go into this in the next two slides. So just to point out that in the book, if you, you do pick it up, there are a lot of stories that I, I tell about women that I've met and interacted with that Women's World Banking has, um, has engaged with. And we measure very, we try to measure as, as clearly as possible and as systematically as possible, the way that they are empowered through, uh, through uh, access to finance. And in the next slide, I, uh, show the framework that we've developed. We were very grateful that Martha Chen of Harvard adapted an earlier framework she had that showed that, you know, in addition to, you know, material changes, having more money coming into the house, the ability to, to uh, have more assets, you could also measure explicit cognitive changes. Women would learn new skills, they would have greater awareness and knowledge as a result of an interaction with a financial product and service. The, the relational change, I think, is some of the most interesting because we find when a woman has more control over financial resources and the tools to manage them, she also gains a greater stay in household decision making. And that's really important because women's decisions for the family contrast very significantly from men's. And we find that they are much more likely to spend money on education, healthcare, 
housing and nutrition, not just for themselves, but for everyone in, in the household. We also have seen some really interesting effects on women uh, perhaps being more likely to vote as a result of being financially included or even run for office. And then I think those perceptual changes, how she perceives herself are, are probably the most, um, most poignant where we, we find women saying they have gained greater self-confidence, greater self-esteem. You see them planning for the future. Um, but what I don't understand, so we've got this macro impact, we've got this micro impact. What I don't understand is why all of this doesn't matter more to financial service providers. And I'll, I'd ask for the next slide because the financial service providers are arguably the ones who stand to gain the most financially, certainly, from the inclusion of un- and underbanked women. Oliver Wyman has identified a $700 billion annual revenue opportunity for banks and other financial service providers if they do nothing more than provide financial services to women at the same rate that they currently provide them to men. And just to, to put that number in a little bit of context, Elon Musk's net worth, or at least this week, is $265 billion. So $700 billion is serious money that's being left on the table by the financial industry. So over the years at Women's World Banking, I've gained a bit of insight into why this might be happening, why this ignoring of this customer base of a billion women um, might just be passing the banks by. Um, a few years ago, a bank in Paraguay asked Women's World Banking to help them expand their rural lending portfolio. And as part of the market research, uh, the Women's World Banking team and some of the bank's uh, credit officers visited a few of their existing clients, all of whom were men, um, and that included a soybean farmer named Manuel. And as we toured his farm with him, we noticed that there was a small vegetable garden, a few cows and a bunch of hens in a corner of the property. And we, when we asked Manuel about them, he pointed to Maria, his wife, who had said nothing to us up to this point. And he kind of shrugged and said, well, that's her business. So we went back into the house and Maria served everybody a cool drink. And we started to talk about the family's cash flow and the money that came into the, into the household. And Maria started to talk about the fact that she sold eggs and vegetables and cheese and salsa at a weekly farmer's market and that she came home completely empty handed. She was convinced that she could um, sell more if she had money to buy another cow, to expand the plot of land and plant more vegetables. Um, and then it kind of started to dawn on everybody as the numbers were coming out that since Manuel only had money coming into the house twice a year from the soybean harvest, it had been Maria's earnings over the other 10 months that had been making the timely monthly repayments of the bank's loans all these years. And at that moment, the light bulb went off for the bankers and they realized that it had been, it had been Maria's business, not Manuel's, this business that had been completely invisible to them right under their noses that had been paying their loan and had been you know, accountable for why they thought of Manuel as being such a good, good client. So we went back to uh, back to Asuncion and uh, worked with them on designing a product, and it turned out to be sort of an unsecured loan that we called a sidecar loan, that was alongside Manuel's loan that matched Maria's um, uh, cash flows. And as we were designing the product, we realized that women, at least the women that we were targeting, didn't have anything like the kind of documentation that the bank required and the their, their um, a loan application process was really cumbersome. And so we went about trying to streamline that. And this is the place where we learned a really important lesson that we've got, gone on to apply in many other countries is that when you design a product with women's needs in mind, it typically will work for men as well. The men loved these streamlined documentation requirements, customer satisfaction scores went through the roof. So we know that this, this works and unfortunately the reverse does, doesn't always work when you have a pro client, a, a product designed for men, probably by men, it doesn't really work because it doesn't take into consideration certain things that, that women really need to see in a financial product uh, before they're going to take it up. 
This also turned out to be very good business for the bank. Their, their uh, rural loan portfolio increased to 45% of the total, total portfolio. It, that was up from 40, 14%. And women represented 40% of the rural clients. But this particular story, in addition to having taught us a lot about women-centered design, has stuck with me for another, I think, really more central reason. Um, we went back six months later to see how this sidecar loan had worked with Maria. She greeted us at the door. She looked us right in the eye. She showed us her new cow, her new, um, the new plot of land. But when we asked her what she was most proud of, what had she, what had she accomplished most, it was fascinating that what she said was that she was now seen and respected by Manuel. She considered the biggest change in her life to be the fact that she was seen differently by him and the, her sense of her own self, her own perception had changed um, in, in addition to that. So she'd been kind of in a sense, not only invisible to the bankers and to Manuel, but maybe even to herself. And when women are invisible, they are unable to live their lives to the fullest, and we are all the poorer for it. Their economic empowerment, disempowerment extends just you know, beyond their financial lives and shows up as an important factor in child marriage, in gender-based violence, and the unequal distribution of care responsibilities. So empowering women isn't just good for women, and women shouldn't be the only ones pushing to make it happen. Um, perhaps in closing, I'll just bring us back to, um, to Hiyam. Um, after she brought her husband home and got herself back on her feet, she was delighted that her clients were still interested in her, uh, in her business and her products, and the, the business continued to grow, so much so that she decided to take a second loan from Microfund for Women to expand her kitchen into more of a commercial operation. But unfortunately, about a year later, her husband suffered a second heart attack and had a second hospitalization. But this time, her loan had been bundled together with a, a, what we call a hospital cash microinsurance policy that allowed her to pay for all those non-medical expenses without decimating her savings that she'd been able to rebuild uh, after his first illness. But Again, one of the things that Hiam mentioned as being so important to her just reverberated with me because I've heard it from so many other women over the years. Her proudest achievement during all that she had managed to navigate for her family was that all three boys had completed secondary education and she was very, very proud of that, of that fact. So I think I'll close there and um, turn back to Tony and have a bit of a conversation about um, the, the wider world of, of financial inclusion beyond, beyond the confines of my book. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Mary Ellen. That was great to see. So I've got a couple questions. And again, I'd encourage people, if you all have questions, to put them in the Q&A box. Um, so two things. One, Sort of trends that have become quite uh, strong and um, certainly since our years at SOM. One is the whole realm of impact investing. And uh, I know that Women's World Banking in the last decade or so has launched two different funds. And I'd be interested to hear, I think our group would be, how do you frame particularly equity investments in financial service providers to maximize the likelihood that they will in fact be delivering responsible financial services to women? That's a great question. And it's, pro it's probably one of the things I am proudest of in the time I've been at, at Women's World Banking. Um, the fund actually, the first fund really grew out of a, a piece of research that the Women's World Banking team was doing when I arrived in 2006. They looked at 39 microfinance institutions that had made the shift from NGO to regulated financial service provider. And they found that at sort of time zero, uh, the organization uh, had those organizations, those 39 organizations had on average 
um, 86% women clients. By four years later, four years after they had become a regulated commercial entity, had brought on external shareholders, that had fallen to 59% women clients on average. And it was pretty scary that for the ones that had either a woman CEO or a woman board chair, they were gone and you saw increasing sort of male, male led institutions, the governance was very much, um, very much uh, led by men as well. And so we thought that women's world banking really had a role to play as an investor that sort of maintained that focus on serving women with gender diverse teams. I'm delighted the board supported our efforts. Um, sort of hardest money I've ever raised. The first fund was $50 million and we made 10 investments. We are now you know, very much in, in exit mode for those, uh, those investments. We've got three more to go uh, before we're, we're completely out. And I think we've been very focused on those two things, on making sure that gender diverse teams are in place because there is quite a, a strong um, connection between women in management, women in governance, and an outreach to, to women clients. Um, but also, we've really pushed hard for multiple products to be offered because we tended to find when institutions remained very credit focused, the loan sizes tended to go larger, they tended to go to men, women were much less, a, a, you know, their businesses were much less of interest. But when you combined uh, savings products, insurance products, remittance products, you, you were able to capture much more of that, that women's market. The second fund, uh, so the first one was very focused on, on microfinance institutions. The second fund, um, we just closed uh, at the end of April at 103 million that's looking at a much broader set of financially inclusive institutions. And we're also very, very lucky that we have um, a $5 million technical assistance facility. So some of those, you know, really strong push towards, uh, you know, gender diversity and leadership and outreach to women clients with a broad spectrum of products we're, we're able to actually provide, you know, value creating services, technical assistance to our investees, you know, in addition to sitting on the board where we can sort of advocate from within. Great. So in the first fund that I think you said that you've significantly exited your investments, gotten your, your payout, have you been able to do anything to ensure that the new ownership will continue to support these kinds of responsible practices. We've seen a lot of impact investors exiting and attracting particularly private sector investors. And just as you described in the commercialization of microfinance institutions, a real drift away from those kinds of originally motivated mission-driven practices. Um, that is such a great question. And I think you know, when we, when we we talk about what what is the impact of impact investing, I think we often forget about the exit and the role that a responsible exit plays in having in having that uh, that impact. I, you know, it's it's interesting. We've been pretty fortunate um, since all of the institutions that we're investing in are regulated. The regulator has been in every single country where we've invested has been very supportive of what we're trying to do. In fact, one of our I, I probably shouldn't call it a dog, but one of our poorest performing um, uh, investees that we exited last year, the, the regulator was quite intent on making sure that the organization that we were selling to, because there was a consolidation in the industry, it made sense for us to, to sell into that consolidation, maintained a financial inclusion mission and, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of, Ad adapted the license that was being made available to this consolidator to make sure that it had to have a certain percentage of its loans, a certain percentage of its deposits to the, the, um, 
the, the population that we had been serving all of these years. So we just made a, a very good exit in, um, in Tunisia to an insurance company that we had been partnering with, the company had been partnering with on microinsurance policies. They are very uh, excited about building out that portfolio and have actually now come back to Women's World Banking and have an interest in going elsewhere in the Middle East and North Africa. So I think we'll be able to kind of keep an eye on them if, uh, in a sense, um, after even after our exit. Yeah, I think that's, we, we saw that even in the early years of the emergence of microfinance, the importance of engaging the regulators and that nothing is as compelling as a regulatory structure that both <laughs> right. in, uh, ensures inclusion, but that also allows for inclusion in different kinds of financing structures for these kinds of microfinance banks. Right. So another area that's become quite hot in the last several years is the whole realm of digital financial services. And we've seen a lot of both microfinance institutions as well as so-called FinTechs emerge and target these kinds of clients in terms of lower income women entrepreneurs in emerging markets. Um, say more about what you view digital financial services doing both in encouraging ways in terms of reaching women and perhaps discouraging ways. Yeah, no, well, I, it, is, it is nothing short of a, a game changer that um, digital financial services have, have made the cost of serving customers who, you know, let's face it, are going to be doing very small and often very frequent, um, you know, loans or deposit transactions. So bringing the cost down was so essential to getting them service. So that's super exciting. Um, it, what it has opened up, unfortunately, is, is another gender gap, and that is the gap in smartphone ownership. Um, we've seen, you know, basic flip phones now, there's pretty much parity of ownership, but most platforms, most products, you really do need that internet enabled phone. So right now, the, the global gender gap in smartphone ownership is 18%. It's much higher in, in certain, some countries in certain places. I do think it's one of the, you know, the few bright uh, bright moments of the post-COVID environment is that we've just seen so much more movement onto digital, so many more phones going in, into women's hands. So that's that's all, you know, very very good. Um, and and the fact that um, then fintechs are taking alternative data, you know, top ups of cell phones, you know, thing information about their clients making those into alternative credit scores has been a really interesting development. We've not, we've seen so many women, you know, financial service providers, the first thing they say about them is, oh, we don't have the data. Oh, they don't re report to, um, uh, they don't report to, to credit bureaus. There are far too many countries still where a woman could have a good track record through microfinance borrowing. And then if she were to be able to make that very significant leap to a, a bank loan, she has to start from scratch. That, that, that credit performance is not, is not reported. So if there are other ways for her to establish credibility and, and you know, the fact that she does have a good payment record, you know, FinTech is, is coming up with some interesting ways of doing that. All of that said, um, at least what we're seeing is the majority of lending is still very much consumer lending. Um, these, some of these digital lenders are getting away with interest rates that microfinance would never have been allowed to even contemplate. The, the non-repayment rates are quite high. Um, there's some really interesting data that that for some of these, these companies, the majority of their loans are made sort of within two hours of the time that bars close as more and more loans are, are taken in order to close out your barbell. You know, it's just quite irresponsible. And I'm, I'm frankly really surprised that, that more regulators to bring that topic back again have not been more insistent on some of the consumer protection um, practices that 
were really a lifeline, I think, to responsible microfinance lending. Um, so it is, it's a, a very big concern. I think the other side of that is we are still really looking for digital lenders to be making significant differences in entrepreneurial lending. I think one of the more successful models are ones that embed financing in, you know, supply chain or retail opportunities or this, this, com this combination of finance plus some other service seems to be making the biggest difference rather than direct digital lending. Great, great. So I'd like to turn to some questions from our participants. Um, and again, if you have more, please um, feel free to put them in the Q&A box. So um, I'll just read this. Thank you for an insightful presentation. You noted a $700 billion value left on the table by global financial service providers when not pushing products to enable women's financial inclusion. And you stress this a little bit, but how do you make a similar case for governments to emulate, implement policies that achieve the same objective? What's the impact on GDP or government economic metrics that could get the attention of governments in developing economies? So maybe you can expand on the, the role of regulation, the role of government initiative in this. No, that's that's such a great question. And and I think it's been one of the really gratifying changes, like really only in the last five years, is that you've started to see the IMF recognize, in fact, I just learned this word macro critical, how financial inclusion, they used to sort of always brush financial inclusion aside because it didn't really have that much of an impact on financial stability, which is what they're so focused on. Well, it turns out it, it does have quite an impact on, on stability. Your ability to communicate a, a financial policy is going to be a whole lot easier the more people you have in your financial system. You know, if you've got 70% of the financial transactions in your economy taking place outside of the formal system, you've got all sorts of risks that you're not able to, to monitor. So I think there is a growing data base and resource, research base that's supporting precisely the, those questions you asked. What's been equally interesting is the number of governments in the last, um, you know, the last three to five years that have put in place national financial inclusion strategies. What has been kind of fun for Women's World Banking to observe is very few of the initial strategies had, you know, gender segregated data, had targets for women's inclusion separate from men's inclusion. And what they were finding sort of two or three years down the road is they were making headway with men, but they weren't getting anywhere with women. And the recognition that you might have to do things a little bit different to reach the women. So that's become a nice little side business for us. We're doing um, quite a bit of work with the Central Bank of Nigeria, with um, with the financial regular the CNBV in, in Mexico, and providing advice to these, these governments who've now taken a step back and said, we have to rethink our targets. We have to rethink what we're actually putting in place to, to reach women. So I'm, I'm very heartened that the, the, uh, the regulators have rethought this. Great. So I'll read all of this just to embarrass you. But so the question, curious about the differences among regions, countries <laughs> of the world and their progress in financial inclusion for women and congratulations and hugs to MEI. Uh, hi, Chris, I'm so happy that, that you're there. Yeah, it's, you know, it's really, um, that's what's been so interesting about these last two, two plus years of, of COVID. You know, you saw in India, the government made its first round of COVID relief payments payable only to women and only digitally. So India was probably the country with the largest gender gap in, in smartphone ownership. There were there's some really strong constraining cultural norms around women's ownership of a phone. Um, you saw within literally a matter of weeks, 25 million new accounts opened available, you know, accessible through digital phones, largely by women in order to take that, that, um, that relief payment. So you're seeing, you know, regions that really had, had struggled make some big leaps in, um, 
in the in the current environment. Um, Indonesia, likewise, they converted their biggest conditional cash transfer program to a uh, a COVID relief program. They were paying a lot more frequently than. Um, than they were under the original cash transfer mechanism. And so women were saying, oh, wow, we'd like to save. If we, you know, we know that this crisis may go on for a while, we'd like to save. They hadn't even realized that the, the thing that they were getting, the mechanism that they were getting their payment in, um, their cash transfer in, had been a bank account all along. And so that's we got involved in doing a lot of financial education, explaining how um, how you could save. The most frequently asked question is always, um, "Do I have to tell my husband? Is there some way that my husband doesn't know about this account?" Um, because women really do like that uh, that that um, uh, confidentiality of of savings. So that is one thing that isn't a difference across regions. We see that we see that everywhere. So say more about how. Uh, financial inclusion has responded um, during the COVID crisis and the kinds of things that Women's World Banking has done to try to ensure that um, the unique need needs of women are, are addressed. And, and if you can, we, we've seen in, in a number of places, uh, particularly in US philanthropy, uh, that some of the initiatives launched then have have created sort of a new foundation, new ideas, new structures for moving out of COVID. So I'd be curious if you see any changes that have been taken place that you see as longer term um, mechanisms to continue the work more broadly. Well, it's a it's a it's a great question. I I think we saw sort of we saw both positives and negatives. We saw in most of the countries that we're working in. Um, governments put moratoria on uh, repayments of loans. And so you had sort of a, you know, a nine to 10 month period where microfinance institutions were not being paid. We, amongst those population that, you know, the, that population of institutions, you there, you then saw real differences between those MFIs that did have digital mechanisms, even if it wasn't fully end to end, if they collected di digitally or dispersed digitally, it made an enormous difference than those that were still relying only on the in-person, you know, going and visiting the group of women who would be borrowing together. Um, they lost touch with their clients. There was no way of, you know, connecting with the client and then when the moratorium was lifted, you know, those who had had some kind of digital collection mechanism have been much better at, at sort of getting back to the, the, you know, traditionally very high repayment rates of, of microfinance. So it was really a, a watershed moment. And I think a lot of those organizations that may have been slow to adapt to, to digital and to, to make the investments in technology have really you know, recognized they can't, they can't do it fast enough. Um, so that's been, a, that's been a, a, huge, a huge change. I think one other thing that we're seeing in a couple of places quite interestingly is a, num a lot of women who had home-based businesses during COVID went on to social commerce platforms. And that's that's fantastic. That's wonderful. They can remain home based, serve a much broader audience, but it's really required payment providers to make a much more sort of end to end solution for them so that the transaction can remain completely digital. And I think it's finally dawned on a lot of these payment companies that, it, that, there, that there's a there there. There's a real commercial opportunity to be had there. And that's been very exciting. Um, so I see that as kind of a, another positive and a, a continuation post COVID. So do you do you see the future of these kinds of inclusive financial services being primarily or even exclusively digital? Do you still see a role for the more traditional microfinance model of peer lending or even individual lending, but you know, with the brick and mortar and the loan agents? Or do you see this transition as as many in the field do that really inclusive finance will become almost exclusively digital in the next 
10 to 15 years. Although I do have to say, people have been saying that for about the last 10 to 15 years. <laughs> exactly, exactly. No, and I think, you know, a lot of people have, um, have lost a lot of money and not recognizing the importance of both tech and touch. And every really successful digital introduction that we've had has had a very solid human impact. Um, there's a, there was a, a very successful rollout we did in Nigeria. I talk about it in the book with a bank, unfortunately, that's no longer, that's been subsumed by a much larger bank called Diamond Bank. But it sort of built on the traditional um, collection the, the susu collectors who go around them with the, the market women and collect money and they save in, in that group, Diamond adapted that using, you know, using digital technology. The women could see the account balance changing on their, on their phones, but they were guided through it by, you know, by an individual, by a person that they became very close to, that part of the, the highest savings balances were those people who had formed the closest relationship to their, um, you know, to their collector. And I, I think that's a, that's a principle we've seen in so many places. The best product introductions are the ones that build on a traditional mechanism that, that takes something that's working really well in in an, an environment and then perhaps add the digital element. We've seen in, um, in Uganda, you know, incredibly successful women's savings groups when they transfer to a digital mechanism that allows them to save in a bank, average balances have gone up 40%. Same women, same groups, they were always saving, but the the ease, the connectivity of the digital allows that much more. Great. So if there are any other questions, please raise them. Otherwise, I have a, a last sort of bundle of related <laughs> questions for Mary Ellen. Um, so 15 plus years, you've been totally immersed in this realm. What do you see as sort of the encouraging signs? What do you see as the ongoing barriers? And how do you see sort of moving forward? What would be your call to action in terms of what we need to do now? There's a, there's a lot there, Tony. You're right. That's a big bundle. I think I real I love the impact that we're having as an investor. It is um it's it's just been so fascinating being inside an organization and being able to to push from within. We saw in the first fund, we saw really tremendous differences in those companies where we had a board seat and where we didn't have a large enough stake to get a board seat. So we really pushed to get the larger the larger fund the second time around to make sure that we would always take an, an investment. Um, with a large, large enough stake. So I very much um, see a continued role as an investor for women's world banking and the, you know, the, um, the work of the NGO and all of the research and all we, the product development work and everything we know about client services, I hope that we can put at, at the service of, of our investees. So I'm, I'm very heartened by that. I think one thing that does frustrate my team a lot and we talk about this all the time is you know we're very fortunate that funders will support often support this product design and we'll do a pilot of a product and we feel very strongly that we could we never leave an engagement with a bank or an insurance company unless there is a, a positive commercial outcome that that there's going to be a, a positive customer lifetime value for that that organization. And we're getting some amazing returns, particularly on the digital side. Women, women are already very loyal clients and they tend to be even stickier with those digital clients and, and bring other business to the bank so that that, that customer lifetime value calculation is very, um, you know, is, is, is a very good one. And then we'll show all of this data. We'll get to the end of the pilot. They'll, they'll say how happy they are, and then they'll decide not to roll it out further. And that's been so frustrating. And so we do spend a lot of time thinking about how to, how to 
improve that. And I think one of the reasons why Women's World Banking has maintained the, the network, so you know the network concept very well, but a lot of the organizations that grew up with us in the microfinance space aren't as, as you know, haven't really retained that sense of a network of organizations. That's been our secret sauce because we can do great work. We can show them great CLVs. We can advocate but it's when they hear it from another bank or another insurer or another fintech that this works, that this has been successful and there's real value to that rollout. So I think that's one really important reason why we've stayed a network um, or organization. Um, and then I'm forgetting your your last your last question was a was a little different. And oh yeah, the call to action. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. uh, this is yeah, this is the one thing I would just say. This is what you know, it's a big complex problem. And no, you might not be a central bank governor or you may not be a, you know, run a financial institution, but chances are you do have a relationship with one, if not more financial service providers. Do you even know if there are women in the leadership of your bank or your insurance company? If we know that that's a surefire way to expand, extend uh, services to more women and to make a difference um, in the way the organization deals with issues of values and approaches in values, having more women in those leadership and governance positions is critical. I'd also say, you know, as you look at your individual portfolio, take a look at gender lens investing and take a look at, there's, you know, countless ETFs and mutual funds that are now linking um, their, their returns to different ways of measuring gender, either serving more women, having more women in leadership. It's a, you know, billions of, of assets under management are being um, invested in that way. And it might be something that, that, you know, folks who are listening could think about in their own portfolios. Great, we do have one more question that came up. So on financial inclusion of women, digitization, is it going to boost the economy of a country? What's the role, of, you talked about the micro macro, but what is the macro role of this? And what do you see as this kind of work accomplishing at a macroeconomic scale? Well, you know, to, just to at the, at the risk of, re, of repeating myself, you know, the, the data does appear to indicate that um, the growth in GDP that comes from inclusion literally will not show up. The result will not show up unless those who are most excluded. The the IMF shows quite quite convincingly that the 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 benefits of some of this policy change will only you know go to you know the elites or the incumbents unless the policy changes that are necessary to bring the most excluded are are made you know mckinsey did a, a piece of work when um, the sustainable development goals were um, put into place in 2015 so the, the data is a little old but they have stuck by this number you know, they estimate that if women had access to the same levers, the same economic levers, and that's, that is financial tools, but it's also things like, you know, certain workforce participation, you know, there are still hundreds of countries that have discriminatory laws around the way that a woman is allowed to open a business than the way a man is. If all of those, those tools are put on a pair on parity, you'd have $27 trillion of additional GDP annually in the global economy. So there are, and, and some countries, the way the, the McKinsey report worked is there were some regions that had an even you know, greater need for the financial inclusion. So Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, there's a particular you know, gender gap issues there for access to finance. So the, the real benefits from uh, you know, from that parity would come with with additional financial inclusion. Great, thank you. So I'm under strict instructions to. <laughs> um, we need to wrap up. So I just, as what my teenage son refers to as an OG, I, as an OG in the world of microfinance, I just have to say that it's very heartening <laughs> to see what you've done with Women's World Banking and certainly the innovations and the new areas, but also the way in which you've sustained and really developed 
some of the core ideas around the role of networks, the integration of finance with technical assistance, and the crucial role of engaging with national governments. So thank you so much. And uh, to all of our visitors, I'm required to say, thank you for joining this Yale SOM Exchange webinar. Please keep an eye out for future webinars hosted by the school and um, if you're on the mailing list, which you probably are because you got this, you will see those announced. And thanks to Kayla Heslip, our master organizer and the one who puts all this together and makes it happen. So yes, very Kayla, long. thank you so much. It's great to see you. It's great to talk with you. And for those, I'm not sure there are any current students on now because most of them are scattered, but Mary Ellen will be coming to yes. speak in person at SOM in the fall. And if anybody's interested, uh, you're most welcome. Feel free to send me an email, tony.sheldon at yale.edu if you want to get an invitation to that. So thank you all very much. And especially thank you to Mary Ellen. Congratulations on the book and keep thank up you. the good work. Thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing you in September, Tony. Great. Thanks. Thank you all.